Sponsored by the DuPont Company. Tonight, William Bendix stars in a heartwarming drama of a soldier with a problem. Bernadine, I Love You, on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. Better things that include DuPont nylon, DuPont cellophane, DuPont plastic. Tonight we bring you an original story, one that's full of humor and warmth. It's the story of a paratrooper who had a problem and of how the Red Cross helped him out. We think it illustrates unusually well one of the human little odd jobs which the Red Cross does for the fighters in the line and for the lonesome servicemen behind the line. Warm as a hand clasp and sentimental as young love is our play, Bernadine, I Love You, starring William Bendix as Private Irving Breckenridge on the DuPont Cavalcade. I'm a paratrooper. Paratroopers are a tough, hard-boiled lot, believe me. They have to be. That's part of their equipment, just as much as their boots and guns and parachutes. But in second squad of my platoon, there's a boy who doesn't seem to be that way at all. Tough, yes, when it comes to fighting. But this boy, Irving Breckenridge, has something about him, a friendliness that makes him seem sometimes soft. He's a fellow people like to be around, warm up to, like a big, glowing, pot-bellied stove in the middle of the room. And yet he's the best fighting man in the outfit. I'm Irving's lieutenant. The first time I really noticed Irving was one day when we were circling over a field in North Africa. The boys were lined up waiting for my signal to jump. There was a bad crosswind that could make trouble for us. Suddenly, the wind started rushing in the open door. I could feel the tension rising. I wanted to get the signal now, even though we weren't over the jump spot. The men started shifting with anxiety. Hey, Lieutenant! Somebody must have left the window open. There's a little draft right on the back of my neck. <laughs> that broke the tension. A minute later, we jumped. I think it was easier for all of us because of Irving. Well, that was Irving in North Africa. Two nights later, we made that first terrible jump into Sicily. We fought three days all around the clock. Then it was quiet. We were resting in a barn. Where's the rest of the guys? Where's Bobo? Bobo's dead. Maddie just told me. Where's Bernie? Bernie's dead. Yeah? Man, it sure does rain around here. Anybody see George? You ain't seeing George no more. Listen, Irvin, if you don't want to play nothing, what do you keep that thing in your mouth for? As long as I'm breathing, I might as well get some sweet noise. They got George, huh? I said it tonight. George was all right, he was. Best friend I had in the whole army. Gonna miss that boy. Hey, look, will you kill that thing? Nobody feels left. Heaven, you sure do play mighty pretty. How'd you ever learn that pony? Well, feet's too big, so I can't sweep a gal over by dancing. My hands are too big, so I can't strum a romantic thing on a guitar. My mouth's too big, too, but just right for blowing a harmonica, so I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, how about showing us that picture of your wife, Irving? Huh? Not, oh, no, sir. She's so pretty, one of your wolves is liable to follow me back home. <laughs> I don't like to challenge <laughs> She's you. She's staying right where she belongs, in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that rain. Dog gone, it's... Joe does rain around here. Irving blew his way clear up the Italian boot. No matter how tough it got, he was as good-natured and comfortable to be with as a St. Bernard dog. Being his lieutenant, I wasn't as familiar with him as the men were until a night in England. I was writing a letter in my barracks when he knocked and came in. Uh, evening, Breckenridge. It's on your mind. Well, I've been wanting to ask you a favor, sir, an out-and-out favor. Sit down. Thanks, sir. I'm uh, in a quandary, Lieutenant. About what? Well, as you probably heard after me shooting my mouth off about it so many times, I got a very beautiful wife. She's so beautiful that I wake up at night sometimes. I, I can't believe it. She's just... Yeah, I heard. 
What's your trouble? Well, I want to write her a letter. You see, George got killed in Sicily, and George used to write my letters for me. Oh? Uh-huh. Yeah, you see, I, I can't write, can't spell nothing. Can't write? Well, my fingers are as big as rake handles, and my writing ain't... Well, it's like some old chicken wrote it, so when George, he died, well, sir, there went my handwriting. <laughs> does she think you were writing the letter she got? Uh, yeah, she does. She's a very high-class gal. Her father, he, he owns the big service station down home, and... George, he had a high-class handwriting. And yeah, but well, I write letters for you. She'll notice the difference. Oh, no, sir. You're writing much, pretty much like George's. Isn't you? Anyway, I, I could tell her I sprained my finger so that my writing changed a little. So, uh, could I dictate a letter to you? I, I brought a paper and pen. Yeah. All right. Give it here. What's her name? Well, uh, start off, uh, Dear Bernadine. Dear Bernadine. Well, is that all? Hmm? Don't you want to say, My dear Bernadine, or something more? Like, darling, or... Well, that was the way George always started it off, so we better keep it that way. All right. What next? Well, uh, dear Bernadine, uh, as, as I was telling you before, I, uh, I'm now in Merry England, and it sure isn't nothing like home. They say the people here talk the same language as us, but I can tell you it's strictly baloney. They all sound like they had colds in their heads, <laughs> which may be the case with the climate they got, which is nothing to write home about. Uh, how much is that, sir? About half a page. Well, uh, finish up like this. In case you've been wondering, I'm still healthy as a hog and still getting a big bang out of all this foreign travel. Uh, as they say, it's broadening. <laughs> well, take care of yourself and don't let anyone give you no wooden nickels. You're truly Irving. Hmm. At all? Well, sure, I guess that's all. Well, don't you want to tell her you love her? Oh, no, I couldn't say that. Why not? You do love her, don't you? Oh, sure, but I can't say nothing so personal like I mean, I just can't with a total stranger sitting right alongside of me. All right, then, I'll put it in, and you don't have to say it to me at all. Oh, no, no, sir. Don't, don't put it in, please. You see, well, she's liable to find out someday that I dictated these letters, and she's going to get awfully stewed up if I write a personal thing like, I love you with a stranger listening. I don't know you well enough, Lieutenant. <laughs> I'll save the real stuff for that old hammock on the front porch. <laughs> I want you to know this will be the toughest, biggest job in the history of this division. I can't tell you when we're taking off, but we're beginning today a period of hard training for that job. All furloughs are canceled. The first exercise will be a 40-mile march with a full pack over hilly country. All right, check your packs. We start in 10 minutes. Fall out. does rain around here. Don't bend over, Harry. It's hard to walk in that way. I ain't bending over. I just got shorter. My feet fell off a mile back. Hey, where's Irving? Hey, Irving. How about blowing us a song, huh? Yeah, come on, Irv. Well, that thing, Breckenridge. Johnny comes marching home. Come on. I... I ain't got it in me. What's the matter, Bob? I ain't had a weight out of you in a week. You sick? I'm sick, all right. I never stopped you before. Go on, play. Let me alone, will you? I'm blue. John? Well, Breckenridge, I was wondering when you'd come around again with that mountain pen. Sit down. Well, I just come in to apologize, Lieutenant. Yeah, what for? For not having you write my letters anymore. I didn't want you to feel that I was dissatisfied with the way you did them. I, I come to thank you for everything. That's all right. Where's your stationery? I, uh, I'm not writing any more letters. Why? What happened? Well, sir, do you know anything about that Red Cross fellow that's got his office over at E Barracks? Yeah, he seems nice enough. Look, if you want to get anything off your chest, I'll be glad to help you if I can. I kind of think I'd better go over and see him. Well, that's his business. Go ahead, see him. And Breckenridge. Uh, yes, sir. Whatever it was, whatever it is, I wish you'd get your mind off of it. You've been acting pretty sloppy lately. We're going into a big job, and I want you to have your wits about you. You seem a million miles away. Oh, yes, sir. I'll, I'll go and see the man. You're right, sir. I'm getting terribly forgetful. There's nothing I can do, Breckenridge, if you won't tell me the whole story. The Red Cross is pretty good, but it can't read your mind. I just couldn't stand it if you told anybody, though. All right, now, look, fella. 
In civilian life, I was head of a settlement house. Oh, is that so? Yeah. So I didn't have to come 3,000 miles across the ocean to gossip. <laughs> now, what is it? Well, like I said, she, she's very beautiful. And me, I'm... Well, I'm just a plain old kind of a fellow myself, so I... I kind of worry, you know. A pretty gal like that don't like to sit home for two years doing nothing. The thing is, I, I've been writing her every other day all the time I've been going, but... I ain't got a letter from her in... It, it's over five months now, sir. Nothing at all? No, sir, not a V-mail, not an airmail, nothing. Well, maybe she's sick. If she was, I don't see why she wouldn't write and say so. Mm-hmm. How long were you married back then? Well, we got hitched about two weeks before I left. That's why I worry. She never had much of a chance to know what she drew. <laughs> well, she loves you, though. Well, she married me. The thing is, we're going into a big push in a couple of days, and I... Well, I can't get my mind on my work. You, 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 you can't go jumping out of the airplanes and be thinking about something else it's... At least you can't do it for very long before you ain't thinking of nothing at all. And forever. All right. We'll go to work on it then. Oh, swell. How are you going about it? Well, the Red Cross and the States will uh, send somebody to a house, talk it over, and find out what the situation is. Uh, the lieutenant ain't going to know about this, is he, or any of the men? Put that right out of your head altogether. All right, because I dictated some, well, a lot of letters, and I'm going to look mighty silly if they find out she's been lighting somebody's cigars with them. <laughs> well, I don't think she's been doing that at all. You really don't? No, she probably got lazy, that's all. Put off writing. You know, they forget over the mistakes how much a fellow needs a letter. You go back to your work and forget about it. I'll have some news for you as fast as I can, and I'll lay you a bet it's good news. Oh, man, you do encourage me. You really do. Oh, here, I uh, I ain't showed this to anybody, but you look like a nice fellow, and I'm going to show it to you. Look at that picture. Ain't that the prettiest gal you ever saw? Hey, she's a knockout. <laughs> Peaches and cream, huh? Yeah, and I sure do hope she keeps... You're listening to William Bendix as Private Irving Breckenridge in Bernadine, I Love You, on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. <laughs> Irving Breckenridge, a paratrooper getting ready for a dangerous jump into enemy territory, has asked the Red Cross to find out why his wife has not written to him in five months. As our play continues, the instructor is briefing his men in preparation for their jump into Germany. All right now, everybody. The German for what is the route to Cologne is Wie komme ich nach Köln? Repeat it now. Wie komme ich nach Köln? Ah, that's pretty good. Wie komme ich nach Köln? All right. I'm going to call on you now. Uh, see ya. Uh, are you over there, Breckenridge? Come on, get up, I think it's you. Uh, oh, uh, yes, sir. What's the German way of saying what is the route to Cologne? Uh, uh... Go ahead, Irvin. Be calm. Be calm. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, sir. I don't guess I know. Well, look, boy, you better learn it. Your life may depend on knowing those words. You realize that? Oh, yes, sir. I'll, I'll learn it. All right. Take five, everybody. Maybe you're tired. Second right. Oh, uh, what? Yes, Lieutenant. The Red Cross fellow wants to see you. He's over there by the door. Oh, thanks, sir. Thanks. Uh, before you go... I was just checking everybody's gear. Where's your entrenching to? My... Oh. Well, I, I, I guess I must have misplaced it, sir. Yeah. Now, look here. You want to pull yourself together, or aren't you? Oh, I am, sir. Yes, sir. I, I, I'm just... Breckenridge? Oh, yes. I was just going over to you. Did, did you hear anything? No, but they sent word the Red Cross is working on it in the States. So you buck up now, and everything will be ironed out before you know it. Just leave it to me and forget about it now. Oh, okay. I, I'd just like to know. Even if she was sick, I'm sure she'd write. Is that the trouble, Breckenridge? Uh, oh, yes, sir. She, she ain't ruled for five... Uh, nearly six months now. I, I meant to tell you... Well, I guess you know why she didn't write, don't you? No, sir, I don't. Ten to one of those letters you keep sending her. Well, how do you figure that? She doesn't know whether or not you love her. Well, she's got to know. Don't be so sure. You wrote her letters, you might just as well write your Aunt Minnie. She might think you're just trying to let her down easy. How could she think a thing like that? Why don't you send her a letter and straight out say, Bernadine, I love you? All right. I can't. If, if, if I was writing it myself, I could do it, but I can't dictate a thing like that. It's... It's too personal. All right, then, dictate it to the Red Cross. She won't get mad if she finds out she dictated it to this gentleman. The Red Cross is, well, it's personal. That's right. I've written letters for quite a few men. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I couldn't. He, he, he ain't a real friend, you know. And anyway, his handwriting is different from yours. I can't go switching on different kinds of handwriting every week, you know. All right, then. Dictate it to him, and he'll tell it to me, and I'll write it. you got to get out of this stupor, Breckenridge. Yeah, but that way he's really spreading it around, sir. I'll, 
I'll just carry on until I hear from her. I'll get you word just as soon as it comes. Meanwhile, just forget it. Hmm? Leave it to me. Well, I'll, I'll try, sir. Um, why don't you limber up on that harmonic and play us a good tune? Oh, no, sir. My, my mouth's willing, but if you went in with a magnifying glass, you couldn't find a good tune left in my heart. in his office. Yeah? Okay. Yes, sir. This your parachute, Breckenridge? Why, I guess it is at that, sir. You tired of living? Oh. Oh, I'm terribly sorry, sir. I'll, I'll repack it. I, I guess I wasn't... Sick. Oh, I, I guess you weren't. If you jumped with this chute, you'd have been dead. I don't think I'm letting out a secret if I tell you we're flying for Germany in a few hours. How long do you think you're going to last with a job like this? Well, I... I can't help it, sir. I got a letter this morning. You... That's all? What'd you say? She wants a divorce. Oh. I can't hold myself together, sir. Well, come on. Now. No, I, I don't know what I'm fighting for if I can't come back to her. I swear, she's just everything I ever had in the world. Look, go into the orderly room. There's somebody there waiting to see you. Waiting? Please, sir, I don't want to leave the outfit. I'll, I'll be all right. I just... Go ahead in. Yes, sir. Oh. Oh, it's you, sir. Yeah. Sit down, Breckenridge. I guess the Red Cross better forget about old Breckenridge, sir. I just got a letter this morning. I know. I, um, I got a report on it. Now, look here, boy. You're going into action tomorrow night, and I want you to be there pitching hot and sore. Now, forget about this. I'm awful bad at forgetting a thing like that, sir, but I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying so hard I can't think of nothing else. Why don't you give me a chance? Just leave it all to us. Because we haven't given up. We've got somebody at her house talking the thing over with her. Oh, I don't guess talking's going to do much good, sir. Well, I've known it to work. No, she just got sick and tired of hanging around waiting her. Or how do I know? Maybe she didn't do much hanging around at all. Now, wait a minute. Oh, please. that's all right. Just call it off, will you? That's all the good she was. And maybe it don't matter what she does with herself or what I do with myself. Just let it Now, take that out. That's all right. Just wait a minute. You're busy out here. But all she's done since she left is sit around waiting for you. She doesn't understand the meaning of the war. Well, I guess she doesn't. But we're trying to explain a few things to her. Now, when you get up there tomorrow night, you're going to think about your business and leave everything else to me. You got that? Well, I'll sure try, sir. I'll be jumping with the 2nd Battalion, so if I get any news, I'll try to find you. <laughs> okay, sir. I'm much obliged to you, but... I'm afraid old Breckenridge is going to be the biggest failure the Red Cross ever had. We were flying over France toward Germany. There was no moon, big shoulders of clouds, a dark, dark night. It was two o'clock with the radium face of my watch. I looked down the length of the plane. The two rows of men on either side of the plane were asleep. They were so bundled up front and back they looked like dwarfs. One of them moved. I looked closer. It was Breckenridge, the only one on the plane awake. I walked over to him, bracing myself on the overhead cable that runs the length of the plane. Ah, you still got your mind on her, Breckenridge? I can't help it. Don't worry about me, sir. I can't worry about you anymore. You're on your own now. Snap out of it. All right, right side, on your feet, right side. All right, now, hook up to the cable. Snap it now. Look them over. Careful, careful now. Call out by numbers. Number 12, okay. Number 11, okay. And okay. Each and okay. man inspected the back of the man ahead. Okay. No they took the rip cord the chute okay. to the overhead cable, okay. so when they jumped, the chutes would open automatically. Okay. Irving was in the middle of the line, so I couldn't see him. We're hitting Germany now, so think. Think. All right, open the door, Murray. Right, sir. Okay. Step up. You're thinking now. You're thinking. Step up. The lead man ripped both sides of the open doorway. I studied my watch and looked out but it was dark out there, pitch dark. I grabbed the leg of the lead man. 
Understanding. Send you her love. And there are letters on the way. Misunderstand? How could she misunderstand me? I don't get it. I... Well, it's just like I said. You wrote her all those letters, but she didn't know where she stood. Well, yeah. Well, what do you know? All right. Team up with Harry now and get going. Yes, sir. Thanks, sir. Just, just let me... Look, mister, can I send a message back? Well, what do you want to say? Hurry up. Uh, well, just say, dear Bernadine, I, I, I guess that's enough. Just say, dear Bernadine, I love you. Dear Bernadine, I love you. Yeah. I guess she won't mind if it's only the Red Cross, listen. Irvin, let's go. Yeah, okay, Harry. So long, Mr. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Say, Harry. Harry, you know something? What? Sure does rain around here. <laughs> Our thanks to you, William Bendix, and to all the other members of tonight's DuPont Cavalcade cast. Your portrayal of Private Breckenridge has reminded us all again what a welcome responsibility it should be to all of us to support the Red Cross with our generous contributions. on the DuPont Cavalcade, we bring you the story of how simple faith and poetic imagination stirred seven sturdy brothers to persevere until they had encompassed the last and one of the richest of America's natural frontiers. Our play next week is called The Seven Iron Men. For these seven men who bore the name of merit were the men who discovered a mountain of virtually pure iron up in northern Minnesota's Mesabi Mountain Range. Walter Brennan and Richard Hawk will be on hand as our stars. Be with us next week to hear these two fine actors in The Seven Iron Men.
Music for tonight's cavalcade was composed and conducted by Robert Armbruster. Our play was written by Arthur Miller and was based on material supplied by the American Red Cross. This is Gain Whitman inviting you to listen next week to The Seven Iron Men, starring Walter Brennan and Richard Hawke, on The Cavalcade of America, brought to you by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. <laughs> Thank you.